How's it going everyone, Darren Ruan here and welcome to CodeGaff. In this week's devlog I'll be showing you guys the provisional results of my first proper attempt at an enemy AI implementation. I'm going to show you guys how I used a finite state machine and behavior tree hybrid to achieve this basic hedgedog AI, as well as a few little interesting mechanics that I added along the way. But before we get into any of that, if you want to follow me along on my epic game dev journey then make sure to subscribe to my channel now and hit that little belly button to stay notified of my latest uploads. Oh, I also created a Discord server recently and even though there isn't a huge number of members yet, I gotta say this community is already incredible. If you haven't joined already then you are of course more than welcome to do so, you can find an invitation link for that in the description. So as I mentioned in a previous devlog, I recently invested in a third party plugin for building my games AI called Node Canvas. I ultimately chose this particular plugin over its competitors because of its built in support for not only finite state machines but also nested finite state machines and nested behavior trees. If you want to know more about that decision then I would suggest checking that devlog out, you'll find a link for that in the description too. Thankfully the full source code comes with Node Canvas so I spent quite a lot of time digging around in there and I have to say I was very impressed. The creator clearly put a lot of time, thought and effort into making it and it was very easy for me to extend the functionality even further, which is exactly what I decided to do. I integrated it with my scriptable object architecture so that I could also reference scriptable object variables in the blackboard instead of only being able to reference primitive types. The other thing I did was I extended the nested behavior tree and nested finite state machine nodes by adding on enter and on exit hooks so that I can execute some arbitrary actions whenever a state is transitioned to or from. This was actually a really straightforward thing to implement so I'm pretty confused as to why the creator didn't put these in in the first place but either way they're in there now and I'll show you guys later on how I've managed to use them in my setup. So having made those integration and extension changes, I found myself feeling a lot more comfortable with how the plugin worked, so it was time to actually start building out my enemy AI. To keep things simple, I concluded that there would only be two high level states, at least for now. So at any given time, an enemy will either be engaged in combat or just idling around. As you can see here, to go from idle to combat, the condition is that the enemy has a target. Now this is a very abstract condition, which is exactly what I want because that way I can assign any attackable object as a target and the enemy will engage in combat with it, regardless of what it is. And then of course the condition to go from combat back to idle is that the enemy has no target. This could be because the target died or went out of combat range or some other cool reason that I can't think of right now, but I'm sure it exists. Now keep in mind that these are just states, not behaviors, so they don't describe the functionality they're in, that's going to be the job of the behavior trees that they contain. All this finite state machine cares about is being in a state and transitioning between its states. So if I take a look in here at this nested behavior tree for the idle state, you'll see that it literally just loops the idle animation for now. But I could easily make it do all sorts of things later on if I wanted to. Now if I go back up to the combat state, notice that it's actually a nested finite state machine rather than a nested behavior tree like the idle state is. This concept of logically nesting state machines within one another is known as hierarchical finite state machines. The idea is that you have a high level state that can be broken down further into a series of lower level states. So if I double click my combat node here you'll see that I've set it up to have three nested states within it. Now this might be a bit confusing to some of you so I'll try to explain what's going on here. Basically whenever the user of this AI graph or agent as I'll call it from now on is in combat then it will always be doing one of these three things. It'll either be moving to an appropriate combat position, attacking or getting hurt. Now I know that getting hurt probably shouldn't be in here because that would mean that the agent cannot be hurt if it isn't in the state of combat. This is intentional for now because I don't want to prematurely optimize or over engineer my project. I've already done enough of that at this point and I feel like I just need to get things functional. <laughs> so if you look here at the move to combat position node, you can see that I've actually added an on enter and on exit action. This is the extended functionality that I told you guys I implemented earlier. And if I click on that, you'll see that I'm using it to disable and enable the agent's pathfinding script whenever it leaves and enters this node respectively. Okay, enough boring talk about my implementation, let's go take a look at what this all does in game. 
So I'll start up the game and you'll see that the hedgehog starts moving towards Skelly. When it reaches its destination, it's gonna start attacking. And then if I click my mouse to swing my weapon, you'll see that the hedgehog gets hurt. The transitions between these three nested combat states are very smooth and seamless, which is great. But what I really love is the modularity that I've acquired by using this approach. You see, each of these states encapsulate their own specific behavior. The attack state knows nothing about being hurt or moving to a certain location. The hurt state knows nothing other than what it means to get hurt. And of course, the move to target state doesn't know about anything other than moving to the target location. It's this pair in finite state machine that's responsible for switching out between each of these states, while the behavior trees within them are responsible for carrying out their individual behaviors. So I actually want to run that again and show you guys that the skelly is indeed getting hit. You see, he just doesn't have a horde animation yet, which is something that I'll most likely add in next week. I think it'd be cool to make use of my color changer script here to make the skelly's head go a darker color whenever he gets hit, just as a temporary visual visual queue for now. So I'll add that component on here, uh, I'll specify that I want the sprite renderer for the head to change colour, and then I'll hook that up to the health damaged event like so. So let's start up the game and take a look at that now. If you keep an eye on Skelly's health over here, you'll see that it does indeed decrease with each hit as well. Okay, so the hedgehog will make its way over to the skelly, do its attack, yep, that's gonna hit the skelly, reduce his health by one, and then the color changer script is darkening his head in response to that. That's actually pretty damn cool, that color changing of the skelly's head. It actually kind of looks like he's wearing a little balaclava now, like a little burglar. <laughs> So another thing that I added to the game this week was a concept of aggro. Now, I'm not sure if this is something that I really want in my game, to be honest, but I thought it would be interesting to add it if for no other reason than just to play around with some ideas. The concept is very basic at the moment. It goes like this. When an attackable object should be aggroable, I will give it an enemy aggro checker script. Now, I'll probably change that name later on if I decide to keep this, but for now, that's what it's called. So I'll add one to Skelly, and you'll see that by adding that script, a Circle Collider 2D is automatically added as well. This is the circle that defines the maximum range that this object can be aggroed from by its enemies. Whenever an enemy enters that circle, they will check if they should aggro to it based on a multiplier that they each have. Now I've set it up this way so that different enemies can have different aggro ranges and all I have to do to enable that is change their respective multipliers. So let's center this circle on Skelly and increase its radius out to something like 6 and I'll make that a trigger too so physical interactions aren't applied. Now the final thing we have to do is take a look at this attackable positions property. Now you might recall from a previous devlog how I made it so that attacks are only registered when they are horizontally aligned with their target within a given tolerance. This means that the hedgehog should not be able to attack the skelly from any position, but rather needs to be a bit more tactical in its alignment instead. So what I did was I added a number of attack points around skelly that signify potential positions that he can be attacked from. Whenever an enemy enters the collider of this enemy aggro checker, then these potential attack spots are passed onto it and it will decide if it should aggro and if so which of the attack spots it should target. Now currently the closest attack spot will be picked but I'll probably change this later on. For example when I have multiple enemies I'll probably want to have each of them reserve a spot so that others will not try to navigate to the same one. Another example might be where an enemy prioritizes melee players over ranged players because I don't know maybe they're weak against ranged or something like that. So if I add Skelly's attackable position to this array and start up the game, we should see that the hedgehog is not targeting him because he's actually out of range of the aggro collider. But when I move Skelly into a position where the hedgehog enters the collider, then it will aggro and start engaging in combat. Pretty cool. Whoop. Whoop. Yep. Whoop. <laughs> Stupid hedgehog has no idea that I'm in control, boy. Now, the beauty of all of this is that I can add a couple of attackable positions to this wonderful treasure chest over here, then give it an enemy aggro checker, a reasonable aggro range, and it should be aggroable by the hedgehog right out of the box. Let's go take a look at that. So you'll see here that the hedgehog does nothing to start with because, of course, nothing that it can aggro is actually within its range. It doesn't even know they exist. But when I move Skelly into range, it's going to aggro to him, but only until it gets into range of the wonderful treasure chest, which just happens to be a closer target to it. So it switches its attention and tries to kill it instead. And when it does kill it, I get a missing reference exception, which is to be expected because I currently haven't implemented any hooks to inform enemies about their targets being killed. But once I do that, which will probably next week, what's going to happen is the hedgehog will then turn its attention back to Skelly, since he will be the closest potential target in range. 
And that just about covers everything that I've gotten done since my last devlog. This week was probably a little more technical than usual, so if that deters you in any way, please let me know in the comments below. The last thing that I want to do is confuse people away, but at the same time I really enjoy going into a bit of technical detail, so there's a bit of a balance there that I'm trying to find and I could really use your help to find it. For next week, I will most likely be doing a bit of artwork for the first time in ages. I know, it's been a long time boys and girls. Told you guys I'd chill out on it, but it's getting to a point now where I need to consider it again, I think. I'll also be adding new animations such as a hurt animation for the skelly, a better walk animation for the hedge dog because that one is totally temporary, and also a better attack animation for it too because I'm not really a fan of the little hop hop thingy that it does, you know, whatever you want to call it. There will also undoubtedly be a few things for me to clean up with regards to this AI implementation as well because there are a few issues and rough edges that I want to address, so I'll probably have a look at that. But yeah, nothing else to report for now so thank you guys very much for watching and i'll catch you next week oh and if you're not already a subscriber to my channel and you enjoyed watching this content then consider subscribing now and hitting that little belly button to get notifications of my latest uploads cheers